أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إلى حضة النبي المصطفى صلى الله تعالى عليه وإلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وذريته الصالحين وإلى آبائنا ومشايخنا أجمعين الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين Amin. Ila hadat Sayyidina Sultan Al Imam Ali Ibn Abi Imam Musa Al Kadim Wadi Allah Taala An Wa Usulhi Wa Furuhihi Wa Ahli Baiti Ajma'in Al Fatiha. إلى حضر سيدنا الشيخ عبد القادر الجيلاني رضي الله تعالى عنه وصوله وفرعه وأبناء طريقة يجمعين الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين إلى حضر سيدنا الشيخ كبير أحمد الرفاعي رضي الله تعالى عنه وصوله وفرعه وأبناء طريقة يجمعين الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا إلى حضر سيدنا الشيخ مولانا معين الدين شستي رضي الله تعالى عنه وصوله وفرعه وأبناء طريقة يجمعين الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم آمين إلى حضة سيدنا الشيخ مولى عبد السلام المشيش رضي الله تعالى عنه وصوله وفرعه وأبناء طريقة يجمعين الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا إلى حضرة سيدنا الشيخ بهاء الدين نقشبندي وسيدنا الشيخ أحمد البدوي وسيدنا الشيخ إبراهيم الدسوقي وسيدنا الشيخ سعد الدين الجباوي رضي الله تعالى عنهم ووصولهم وفروعهم وأبناء طرائقهم أجمعين الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين إلى حضر سيدنا الشيخ يحيى بن محمد رضي الله تعالى عنهما ووصوله وفرعه وآل بيته أجمعين الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين رب اغفر لي ولوالدي آمين اللهم أنت ربي لا إله إلا أنت خلقتني وأنا عبدك وأنا على عهدك ووعدك ما استطعت أعوذ بك من شر ما صنعت 
أبو لك بنعمتك علي وأبو بذنبي فاغفر لي فإنه لا يغفر الذنوب إلا فصلي يا رب وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد واغفره لنا جميعا يا خير الغافرين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والحمد لله رب العالمين remember حافظ عمر مجيد the son of شيخ نبيل الله سبحانه وتعالى جنة الفردة as well as حافظ توفيق شيخ مجاهي student who also was made shaheed in a very tragic way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them Jannat al Fitrus. Amen. Put sabr in the hearts of the families. Alhamdulillah wa shukulillah. We have now journeyed to Madinat al Munawwara. We have come to Makkah al Mukarramah and we are retracing the footsteps of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How can we forget that faithful event when the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam went from Makkah to Mukarramah? سبحان الذي أسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى. retracing the footsteps of the journey of إسراء من المكة المكرمة إلى مسجد الأقصى to the furthest mosque الذي باركنا حوله. and we know Allah سبحانه وتعالى Himself testifies unto the blessed nature of those precincts. لنريه من آياتنا and we are hoping to trace the footsteps of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam going from Makkah to Al-Makarramah to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa and to be able to see the ayats and the signs of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala throughout our trip insha'Allah bi'idhnillah and uh, we are hoping that on our way to Al-Aqsa we will stop by insha'Allah in Jordan to uh, make ziyarah of Nabi Shu'aib and Ashab al -Kahf. So uh, we are very, very fortunate to be given this opportunity to retrace those steps. So starting out in Istanbul, going to Madinat al munawwara from there to Makkah al mukarramah from there to Jordan, to Amman, and from there, insha'Allah, to Masjid al-Aqsa, all of it in the month of Rabiul Awwal. That's a great gift. I just received a call from one of our very close friends today from Masjid al-Aqsa, Sheikh Nadir. He's one of the uh, uh, murids of Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jailani in uh, uh, Jerusalem. And they are amongst the Qadiriya Zawiyah there. And they are looking forward to seeing us, inshallah. And uh, he conveyed, and he asked me to share with all of you that he has conveyed today, he went with somebody that I know to Al-Khalil, to Sayyidina Ibrahim. And he conveyed all of your salams. To Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wassalam. So these are amongst the, the great opportunities. I'm going to ask uh, Sheikh Mujahid if it's possible, just the first two verses of uh, Surah Al Isra, if you can recite, and then inshallah we'll ask Sheikh Fakhuddin to go straight into his lecture. Bismillah. The mixla is on. Mixla is on. Yeah, and the mixla is on the, on the chat group. So if anyone wants the, 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 Tonight is on Mixla. Um, our brother Nazmi bin Hassan will load later, inshallah. <coughs> so I will put that also on the Iraq group. So everyone has it, inshallah. Yeah. So without further ado, we ask um, uh, Sheikh Mujahid to recite a few verses of Surah uh, Sorry. <laughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحان الذي أسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله 
الذي باركنا حوله لنريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير وآتينا موسى الكتاب وجعلناه هدى لبني إسرائيل ألا تتخذوا من دوني وكيلا ذرية من حملنا مع نوح إنه كان عبدا شكورا وقضينا إلى بني إسرائيل في الكتاب لتفسدن في الأرض مرتين لتفسدن في الأرض مرتين ولتعلن علوا كبيرا وقضينا إلى بني إسرائيل في الكتاب لتفسدن في الأرض مرتين لتفسدن في الأرض مرتين ولتعلن علوا كبيرا صدق الله العظيم جزاكم الله خير جزاء to شيخ مجاهد توفي for that beautiful recitation from the Holy Quran. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and grant you khair. And we are very honored to have uh, Sheikh Mujahid Tawfi with us on the trip, inshallah. And we are hoping that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will grant him the strength Amen. to recite for us at every step of the way. Amen. Because wa khairul hadith kitabullah. The best speech is the kitab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah bless you, uh, Sheikh Mujahid, and grant sabr and grant your students the best, insha'Allah. Without further ado, we'd like to hand over to Sheikh Fakhuddin Uwaisi Al-Madani, insha'Allah, to take us on the journey through Jordan, Sheikh, with maybe something on Nabi Shu'aib and Ashab al -Kahf. And then the land of uh, Al-Isra wal miraj is well known for many, many Anbiya. And especially in the Al-Aqsa compound, if you look around, you see um, reminders of Sayyidina Sulaiman um, and you go around the city, Sayyidina Dawood, Sayyidatina Maryam, Sayyidina Isa. There's also remnants of Sayyidina Musa السلام, and uh, Sayyidina Ibrahim Al Khalil and his son Sayyidina Ishaq, oh. his wife Sayyidina Yusuf, Sayyidina Yaqub, Sayyidatina Sara. So you have lots and lots of Anbiya and lots of historical places. And most importantly to us, the incident of Mi'raj took place um, and the ascension to the heavens took place directly right there at the Dome of the Rock. And there is a portion right next to it which is the Mihrab of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is alleged that he is prayed there as well. So there's lots to talk about and we hand over to Sheikh Fakhuddin Uwaisi Al-Madani. Faliyatafaddal mashkura Sheikh, without visa, without ticket, 
without accommodation, without anything, take us to all these beautiful places. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Rasulillah. وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن والاه اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أغلق والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته Indeed Mecca and Medina are honored because of two prophets in particular Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam and Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Makkah is connected to Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam and Medina is connected to Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And both of these prophets are also directly connected to the Bilad al-Sham. Bilad al-Sham refers to the lands of Palestine, Jordan, Syria, that whole piece of land is called Bilad al-Sham in Arabic. So Sayyidina Ibrahim salam and Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم, like they blessed Makkah and Medina, they also blessed the Bilad al-Sham. So Nabi Ibrahim salam is buried there, he lived there, and Nabi Muhammad وسلم, visited there and prayed there. So that barakah spreads in that land. And then not only Nabi Ibrahim and Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there were also hundreds of other prophets between them that lived and prayed and are buried in Bilad al-Sham. So that is why it is known as Ardu al-Nubuwa and Ardu al-Anbiya, the land of the Anbiya, land, land of the prophets. And that is why it is also referred to in the Quran as Al-Ard Al-Mubarakah, the blessed land. Even when Allah mentioned how he took our Prophet ﷺ from Makkah to Jerusalem, to Al-Quds, right? Jerusalem is the English name and the Arabic name is Al-Quds. And he, Allah mentioned that. He said, Subhana allazi asra bi abdihi laylam min al-masjid al-harami. إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله. So glory be to the one who took the Quran says glory be to the one who took his servant from the Masjid al Haram. Haram means sacred from the sacred mosque of Mecca to the farthest mosque, the Masjid al Aqsa, الذي باركنا حوله, the land around which we have blessed. The land around which masjid, which around the Aqsa, the land that we have blessed. So Allah said, I took my Nabi from Makkah to the land that I blessed. So imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the land that he has blessed, that land. So indeed that is the land of Bilad al-Sham. And inshallah, I believe your journey will start uh, from Jordan and then into Palestine, Palestine. And uh, Jordan is part of Bilad al-Sham and there are Anbiya. Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are resting in, Bilad, uh, in Urdun, in Jordan. And amongst them is the father-in-law of Nabi Musa alayhi salam. Now, a lot of prophets appeared from Bani Israel, from the Jews. Uh, Bani Israel are the descendant of Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam, son Ishaq. While the Arabs are the descendants of Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam, eldest son, Ismail. So Ismail alayhi salam's descendants are the Arabs, the Ishmaelites. And Nabi Ishaq alayhi salam's descendants are the Jews, the Israelites. Hundreds of prophets appeared among the Israelites, among the Jews. But only four prophets appeared among the Arabs. Who were the four prophets that appeared amongst the Arabs? The most obvious one is Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now who knows another prophet who was an Arab? Not a Jew, an Arab. Anybody knows? 
Yes. We will come to the one we are visiting. Uh, Nabi Salih alayhi salam. You heard of Nabi Salih alayhi salam. Uh, Sayyidina Salih alayhi salam was sent to the people of Samud. He was an Arab. He was not a Jew. Uh, like Nabi Musa, Nabi Isa, Nabi Dawood, Nabi Sulaiman, these were all Jews. They were Israelites, descendants of the, you know, the, the line of Ishaq. Another one from the Arabs was Nabi Hud alayhi salam. Hud alayhi salam. Not Yahud, huh? Hud. <laughs> Nabi Hud alayhi salam, he was sent to the people of Ad. Qawmi Ad, the people of Ad, these people Ad, they lived in, in the region that is today between uh, Oman and Yemen. Southern Arabia, in the south of Arabia. Oman and Yemen, they had a great civilization, but their civilization led them to transgression and evil and sin and rebellion against the Creator and oppression on His creation, which Allah then sent a prophet to them, Hud alayhi salam. They didn't listen to their prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then destroyed them all. Yeah, tilka masakinuhum. Now you find their palaces and remains are standing there. Nobody lives there. Nothing is there. Nabi Hud alayhi salam. Nabi Hud alayhi salam is buried in Yemen, by the way. His maqam is in Yemen. It's a very famous maqam. Maqam Sayyidina Hud alayhi salam. So I said four. And the fourth one is, inshallah, the one you shall be visiting in Jordan, and that is Nabi Shu'aib alayhi salam. Nabi Shu'aib alayhi salam. So, none of these three are mentioned in the Bible, by the way. Well, all four are not, you know, referred to in the Bible. Uh, the Bible only talked about the Jewish prophets. So, Nabi Shu'aib alayhi salam was an Arab. However, he was the father-in-law of Nabi Musa alayhi salam who was from the Jews, from the Israelites. So we know that Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to make him a prophet and guide him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him away from Egypt. He was raised up in the household of Fir'aun. We know the story how Fir'aun wanted to kill all the babies of Bani Israel and Allah saved Nabi Musa alayhi salam and made Fir'aun raise Musa alayhi salam. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to protect somebody, he will even make those who want to kill that person be the protectors of that person. Wow. Ajib, you know, it's amazing. Fir'aun one killed hundreds of babies, for, not because of those babies, because they wanted to kill Musa. But in order to kill Musa, he said, just kill all the babies. We don't know which one is the one that we're looking for. Just kill every baby, male child in Bani Israel. Yet they killed everybody but Musa alayhi salam. And Allah made Fir'aun raise up Musa alayhi salam inside his palace as a prince. It happened. His wife adopted him. Right? Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, she adopted the baby. And even Fir'aun, even with all his arrogance and kibriya, couldn't fight with his wife. <laughs> <laughs> so we can't try it also. <laughs> Fir'aun, who is the epitome of arrogance and Kibriya, even he couldn't say no to his wife. She came with that child and said, we are adopting this child. Khalas. I don't have a child, I want to adopt this beautiful baby. Even he couldn't say no. And they ended up raising that child. And that's the one that he killed all the children of Bani Israel because he was told by his priests that a baby has been born amongst the Jews that will destroy you and your kingdom. The priests, the sorcerers told him, the fortune tellers. That's why he said, kill every baby in Bani Israel. Boy, every boy, kill him. Yet the one they had to kill, his wife adopts him. He grows up in the palace like a prince. SubhanAllah, Allah can be funny also. Huh? <laughs> you know? SubhanAllah, you know, uh, what he does, you know, is, uh, can appear funny to us, you know, but there's great hikmah in that. But anyways, uh, we are not going to discuss Musa alayhi salam too much. Musa alayhi salam story is long and beautiful and inspiring. He, uh, when he grew up uh, at one stage of his life, to cut a long story short, he realized who he actually was. That he's not actually Fir'aun's son, he's from the Bani Israel. And then things happened and in the end he had to leave. He just left Fir'aun's palace and the whole, that whole life he left. And he ended up in a place called Madian, a city called Madian. And there he met Sayyidina Shu'aib alayhi salam. And then he married 
a daughter of Sayyidina Shu'aib alayhi salam, and he lived for 10 years under Sayyidina Shu'aib alayhi salam. So his first ustad in the path of Tawheed and the oneness of Allah and Nubuwa, Sayyidina Shu'aib alayhi salam. So if everybody speaks about Nabi Musa and Moses the Great, the one who received the Torah, the ustad was Sayyidina Shu'aib alayhi salam. A great Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran in detail, who went to the people of uh, Ashabul Aika. They were called the people of the Aika. They had a tree that they used to worship. And uh, they were engaging in all kinds of wrong activities. And Allah had sent Nabi Shu'aib alayhi salam to them. And they denied him. They said to him, you are a liar and we don't believe in you. In the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed them. So Nabi Shu'aib alayhi salam is buried uh, in the land of Jordan. So inshallah you will be honored to visit his maqam. Uh, it is an honor to stand at the maqam of a Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To make you realize the honor of that is many of us we like to visit the, the mazars, the karamats, you know, the, of the awliya. We go to the different awliya and we greet and we, different, you know, uh, dargahs and so on. But all the awliya Allah in the world, all the awliyas in this world put together cannot match the nur, the barakah and the rank of a Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the awliya in this whole world put together cannot match the nur and the barakah and the rank and the daraja of a Nabi of Allah. Vilaya. The Nubuwa starts where Wilaya ends. Nabi, even Rasulullah said to him, Ali, you are to me what Harun was to Musa, but there is no Nabi after me. In other words, that, that door of Nubuwa, nobody can come near it. So a Nabi is that rank. Those are the Ulaika Zalina, Ulaika Ladina Hadallah. They are the special chosen ones of Allah from mankind. The greatest of mankind, the greatest human beings that ever lived are the Nabis of Allah, the Anbiya. And the Anbiya were many, and from them the greatest are the ones mentioned in the Quran. There's 25 of them mentioned in the Quran, and Nabi Shu'aib is one of them. So you could say, without any hesitation, that from the millions and billions of people that walked on this earth, Nabi Shu'aib is from the 25 greatest human beings that ever lived on this earth. The most holiest and the most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say, all the Anbiya are my brothers. So, you visit a great Nabi, when you visit there, you get salam to them. And our shuyukh used to say that when you make salam to a Nabi of Allah, you give salam to him on behalf of your Nabi as well. So you say, Assalamu alaikum ya Nabi Allah. And you say, Assalamu alaikum ya Nabi Allah, min Nabiyana Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You pass the salam of our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because you are his ummah, you represent him. Every one of us represents Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you give, when you're greeting another Nabi, you say, I bring you the salams of my Nabi as well. That's part of the adab and the respect. And you make dua there because dua is mustajab by the maqams of the anbiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So amongst uh, the maqams in Jordan then, there are many others, uh, amongst them also is what we all know as Ashabul Kahf. We all recite Suratul Kahf on a Friday, Kahf means a cave, okay, Kahf means a cave. Ashabul Kahf means the people of the cave, the people of the cave. Who are the people of the cave and what? Cavemen. No, they were not what we call cavemen today. What is their story? The people of the cave. These were young men, youth, youth who were from the followers of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. Upon the haq, the deen of that time, when Nabi Isa came with his deen, it reached them and they believed in him, but they were oppressed. And the king of the time was the evil king who was against the truth and the haq. He was an idol worshipper, a pagan. And he uh, uh, decided to persecute whoever was on the deen of Isa alayhi salam. He said, I don't want anybody in my town on this deen. They said, there is a group of youngsters who are now on that deen. He told the soldiers to catch them and crucify them and kill them and torture them. So they fled for their lives. They made hijrah to, when they heard what's happening. And they were followed and pursued by the armies of that evil Roman king. Were the Roman king. Uh, that Jordan and that area was ruled by the Romans at that time. And they went up to the mountain 
and then they went inside a cave. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the cave close up on them and they had a dog with them and that dog slept outside the cave. And they, because they had climbed that mountain, they became tired and they fell asleep. They fell asleep after a long run from the authorities. The authorities did not catch them. They went up, they looked around, the mountain is big and the, the cave is closed and there's a lot of caves there and there's somebody, a dog and whatever, and they left them. They didn't do anything. They thought the guys are gone. They slept. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran that they slept and Allah made them sleep for more than 300 years. Subhanallah. That's one of the karamat, the miracles that happened. <clears throat> they woke up 300 and years later. Subhanallah. That's the karama of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah mentions how, they, how the sunlight used to come into their cave and how they used to نُقَلِّبُهُمْ ذَاتَ الْيَمِينِ وَذَاتَ الشِّمَالِ They used to turn them right and left. And now the ulama today, they say, you know, um, when the sunlight would come on one part of the body, it keeps it warm, from, uh, stops it from disintegrating. Then when they turn, it comes on the other side and so on. And there's some, uh, you know, secrets in the whole thing. But to cut a long story short again, because we are discussing a lot of things, uh, each of these personalities, you can have a whole... Uh, our discussion on them, they woke up, they didn't know that they had slept for 300 years. So they were hungry, they had some money, they only thought we slept for a day or whatever, or it's the next morning, and they told one of them, take here some money, and go uh, change your appearance and so on, and go to the town and buy us some bread. Because we are hungry, we are really hungry, we want to eat something, go buy bread. So nobody is going to look for us now, it's all over now, it's 24 hours. So he went down. When he went to the shop, to the bread, uh, to the baker, when the baker saw the money, the coins, he was shocked. He said to them, he said to this, this man, he said, where did you get these coins from? He said, I got it from where everybody gets it, we buy and sell. He said, who are you? And he gave the name and uh, the baker then went and took the coins and reported it to the authorities until the matter reached the king of the time because the coins that he were, they were buying the bread in were coins that were 300 and so many years old and they had the picture because that time they used to have the picture of the king on the, on the, the coin the picture was of a king that was ruling more than 300 years ago like somebody comes to a shop today with a rand note with Jan van Riebeek on it you know. He says, brother, what time do you live in? You know, what picture is this? You know, how old is this, this paper? <laughs> so, subhanAllah, three, this king that lived 300... Huh. So, subhanAllah, in the end, again, to cut a long story short, now something else had happened, by the way. In that 300 years that passed by, times had changed, and that entire region had accepted the deen of Isa, alayhi salam. So, the king, the people of the village, everybody was followers of Nabi Isa, alayhi salam. And they had heard about the story of the seven holy young men who had fled for their lives and went up to the mountains, but nobody knew where they went and what happened to them. And the story was still amongst the people of that village, but nobody knew anything about them. When the king found out that and went to meet them and they realized who that man was, he took them to the cave and told them, he told them don't worry, we're not going to do anything to you, we are honoring you. Those seven men were, young men were discovered. Innahum fityatun amanu bi rabbihim wazidnahum huda. Allah says they were young men who believed in their Rabb and we guided them. We guided them. Ajaba, Allah says, the story is amazing. So uh, they were then honored by the king and they were treated as saints. Uh, and they were also shocked and the king was shocked that these people are still alive after 300 how many years. They... <coughs> They were honored and they lived for a short while after that. And after that, they passed away. And their story increased the iman of all the people at that time. And even those who had not believed in them, uh, in, 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 in the message of Isa alayhi salam, all of them converted to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after witnessing that incident. It was one of the most amazing things that happened. And in the Christian uh, history, they are known as the seven sleepers. The seven sleepers. After they passed away, a maqam and a masjid, a place of ibadah was built where they were buried. 
And that remained for many centuries and it was hidden for a while until it appeared again a few centuries ago in Jordan. And the people who did the excavations there, for many centuries it was hidden. They confirmed that these are the graves of seven young men. And then when you did the research from an Islamic historical point of view, they found that they are exactly in the place where the Ashabul Kahf were supposed and reported to have been. So subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, now the place is renovated nicely and all the people can go and visit the Ashabul Kahf. So again, we are visiting these great awliya. They were not anbiya. They were not anbiya. They were not prophets. They were awliya. But from the ummah of Nabi, Isa alayhi salam, followers of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. So once again you visit them, you reflect on Allah's power. If Allah can protect them from their enemies and they outlive all the enemies, imagine that all these people wanted to kill them and they outlive all their killers. All the soldiers that wanted to kill them, the king that wanted to kill them, the priest, whoever, everybody is dead and they outlived everyone for hundreds of years. It just shows you the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you reflect on their story, you should read the whole story and see how the lessons that we can learn from Ashabul Kahf. And again, it's a mustajab place where du'as are accepted and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rahmah descends because of those pious young men laying there. But in Jordan, you don't only find Ashabul Kahf, young men from the Ummah of Isa alayhi salam, you also find the maqams of equally great and equally pious and equally valiant and brave young men from the Ummah of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there's no doubt that the awliya of our Ummah are higher in rank than the awliya of our previous Ummahs. Because our Nabi is higher in rank than all the Anbiya that came before. So you also find in, in uh, Jordan, in the battlefield of Mu'tah, Great Sahaba of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who are buried there, whose maqams are there. Yeah. Sayyidina Ja'far bin Abi Talib. We all know Sayyidina Ali, father of Hassan and Hussein, husband of Fatima Zahra, son-in-law of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi cousin of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his older brother, Sayyidina Ja'far bin Abi Talib, from the earliest people to accept Islam. And he was like, uh, a, a brother to our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because they grew up in the same house together. And Rasulullah loved him to bits. One day when somebody said, Ya Rasulullah, Ja'far looks just like you. He used to be very similar to our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ja'far is similar to me, not only in his looks, but also in his character. Ja'far ashbaha khalqi wa khuluqi. Ja'far is like me, not just how he looks, but even in his akhlaq and character is like me. That's one of the greatest accolades that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam can give to anybody in this Ummah. Sayyidina Ja'far was that person. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam conquered Khaybar, one of the biggest victories in his life against the Jews of Khaybar, after that conquest, Sayyidina Ja'far returned to him. Because Sayyidina Ja'far was one of the Sahaba who had migrated to uh, Ethiopia in the early days of Islam. When they were being persecuted in Mecca, the Nabi Sallallahu said to them, Allah has given you the land of Ethiopia as a safe haven. Those of you who want to make hijrah there can go there. There is a good king there. So Sayyidina Ja'far was one of the people and we know he is, one of, he is the one that represented the Muslims in front of the king of Ethiopia. If you watch that movie, the message where they nicely portray that whole scene of Ja'far speaking to the king of Ethiopia. So he only returned to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 10 years later. Imagine a decade later, somebody who loves so much. And this is in the age before WhatsApp and phone call and cell phone and Skype and none of these things were there. He only came 10 years later back. So he came at the time when the Prophet ﷺ conquered Khaybar. He just arrived in Medina. They said the Prophet ﷺ is by Khaybar. So he went to Khaybar. When the Prophet saw him coming, they said he was so happy. He said to his Sahaba, I don't know what makes me happier. The conquest of Khaybar or the return of Ja'far. لا أدري بأيهما أسر فتح خيبر أو قدوم جعفر. So I don't know which one makes me happier to see Jafar back. It's even ha makes me happier than the conquest of Khaybar. This Jafar is the one who the Prophet ﷺ sent to lead an army against the Romans. The Romans had amassed an army in Jordan and they were planning to attack Medina. So the Prophet ﷺ sent an army of Sahaba, 3,000 Sahaba, and said that. Uh, don't, we're not going to wait for them to come towards Medina. 
go and face them there and fight them in. And he appointed Ja'far to be the leader of this army. He gave the flag to Sayyidina Ja'far bin Abi Talib. And then he said, if Ja'far is martyred, then the flag goes to Zayd bin Harissa. Who is Zayd bin Harissa? Zayd bin Harissa is also from the most beloved of people to our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was the adopted son of our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Initially he was brought to Makkah as a slave and sold as a slave. But the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took him as a son. His wife Sayyidah Khadija bought him in the marketplace. Or was actually gifted him by her brother who bought him in the marketplace. The brother gifted it to her. Take this slave for you, you know, like a maid. And she came home and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I want to take him as a son for me. Adopt him as a son. So he was even called Zaid bin Muhammad for many years. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran that called them by their fathers. Right? Zaid bin Harissa. So he was known as the son of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa One amazing incident that happened with him was that once his parents, his original parents from whom he was kidnapped and stolen as a slave years ago, they were still looking for him. And eventually, one year, they located him. That he is in Makkah and he is a slave in Makkah. So his parents came to Makkah. His father came to Makkah. And met him and recognized him and he recognized his father. And he wanted to take him home. He said, who is, he said, I am with Muhammad. So he went to the Prophet wasallam and said, Harissa said, Oh Muhammad, this is our son that is in your captivity or slavery or so on. Uh, we are willing to pay any amount of money you want for him. We will pay you out. Fine, if you bought him or whatever, he's a slave, we'll pay you out. Please then give him to us. Return him to us. The Prophet ﷺ replied that, uh, first of all, he's not my slave. I have adopted him as a son. And secondly, second of all, I will not charge you any money to take him. He is free to go with you. However, he is a big boy now, because by that time he was like 15, or mukallaf, you know, so he's no more a little child. And he spent many years with the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa So I will leave the decision to Zaid. If Zaid wants to go back with you, then by all means he can go back with you without any payment. You don't need to pay me anything. He can go for free. But if Zaid wants to stay with me, then you cannot forcibly take him either. He's a mukallaf now, he's a grown, you know, person. So the father looked at Zaid, he said, Zaid, come, let's go. So Zaid looked at his father, he said, indeed, I have missed you, and I missed mommy, and our people, and our village, and our tribe, and family, you know. But, wallahi, this man has treated me like a son. And, la uridu mufaraqatahu abadan, and I do not want to ever leave this man. He said, indeed, this man has treated me like a son. And I, I never want to part with this man. Imagine how nicely would have Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam treated him. That he preferred to stay with the Nabi than to go with his father and mother. That's the akhlaq of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this whole thing happened before Prophethood for your information. Before Jibreel Alaihi Wasallam came to our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the Quran. This is before that. That akhlaq of the Nabi was from that time already. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So, Zaid's father, who didn't get upset, he went and he hugged the Prophet sallallahu and kissed his forehead and he said, Oh man, you are a stranger to us. But if you have treated my son so nicely, I'm happy to leave him with you. If you have treated him so nicely that he loves you so much, then I feel no pain in leaving him with you. I don't want to leave him with somebody that's abusing him or hurting him. But if this is how you have treated him, then God bless you. And he kissed the forehead of the Nabi He said, keep our son. So that is the relationship of Zayd and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Sayyid Aisha says, Wallahi, I didn't see him love anyone like he loved Zayd. said, one day when Zayd came back from one of the battles, she said, they said to her, how, did you, how much did he love him? She said that he came from a battle once. So I saw he was laying in his room, wearing what you call today the lungi, you know, the sarong, you know, only that. And he had no shirt on because it's very hot, it's hot, Arabian heat, you take your shirt off, it's sweating. Somebody said, Ja Zaid, Zaid has come back. It was from one of the battles. She said, Wallahi, he got up and he went out of the house just like that. Just like that. 
you know, wearing nothing on the upper part of his body. He just went out like that and he said, Zayd, ya Zayd, and he hugged him. And he hugged him like a father hugs a son. And she said, Wallahi, I didn't see him do that for no man on earth. Go out like that. She said, I never saw him go out like that for anyone but Zayd bin Harissa. That was the love. So much so that he, Zayd was known as Hibbu Rasulillah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The title of Sayyidina Zayd is Hibbu Rasulillah. The beloved of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Again, I can talk whole night about Zayd and there's so many stories of Zayd. But the Prophet Sallallahu said, if Ja'far is martyr, Zayd takes the banner. And then he said, and if Zayd is martyr, then Abdullah bin Rawaha takes the banner. Abdullah bin Rawaha is one of the great Sahaba of Medina, and he was known as the poet of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He used to write poems for the Nabi Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. So Subhanallah, uh, in that battle, all three of them were martyred. One by one, as the Prophet had predicted, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, until Sayyidina Khalid bin Al-Walid took the banner, and led the Muslims to safety and protected them and saved them on that day. So these three great Sahaba are buried there in Mu'tah. The battle was called the Battle of Mu'tah. Mu'tah. So in the battlefield there, you find the maqam of Sayyidina Ja'far al-Tayyar. Now he's called Ja'far al-Tayyar. Ja'far the flyer. Or Ja'far zul junahin. Ja'far the two-winged one. Why is he called that? Because... The Prophet ﷺ said when he, Allah showed him what happened in the battle, so he said to his Sahaba, they killed Ja'far. He was sitting with them in the Medina in the Masjid, he said they killed Ja'far. And they cut both his arms off. They cut one arm off, so he held the banner with the other arm. So they cut the other arm off, so he held the banner like that. The banner of Tawheed, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, until they beheaded him. So ﷺ cried in front of the Sahaba for Ja'far. And then he looked up in the sky and then he smiled. He said, they cut his arms off, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaced them with two wings. And I just saw him fly above me in Jannah and greet me. He said, I just saw Ja'far fly above me in Jannah and greet me. That's why he's called Ja'far al-Tayyar, Ja'far the flyer and Ja'far zul janahin, Ja'far the two-winged one. And then the Prophet ﷺ said they killed Zayd and he cried. And he adopted the children of Ja'far and Zayd, by the way. The children of Ja'far and the children of Zayd were looked after by the Prophet ﷺ after that. He sent a message to their wives to say that I will be looking after them. So Abdullah bin Ja'far and Usama bin Zayd. Abdullah bin Ja'far and Usama bin Zayd were raised up by the Prophet ﷺ. So Jamaatul Muslimin, when you go to Mu'tah, you go to the maqam, and there's so much more to the stories of these men, but we are covering very quickly and just touching a little bit on each one. You will have the honor of standing by the maqam of Sayyidina Ja'far al-Tayyar, and the maqam of Sayyidina Zayd bin Harissa, the maqam of Sayyidina Abdullah bin Ruwaha, and the martyrs of Mu'tah. Give our salams to them and pray for the ummah by them, because that is a place where du'as are accepted, and a place that is mustajab and mubarak, because you have the beloveds, of our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa laying there. Radiallahu anhum wa ardahum. From Jordan, you proceed to the blessed land of Palestine. Urdun in Palestine. Palestine is the land Allah has blessed with countless anbiya. And in Palestine, the land of Palestine, also, you know, known as the illegitimate state of Israel. You know, people think Palestine and Israel are two different countries. It's one country. Uh, we call it Palestine, they call it Israel, you know. But obviously when you are with them, you don't refer to Palestine, you know. So obviously when you're at the airport and stuff, you know, you, uh, you avoid those type of thing, discussions. Because it's an occupied territory, you know, it's a uh, occupied territory by the Zionist regime. So you don't get involved in the politics and so on, and uh, because they want to do your ziyara and all that, and you don't want to get caught up with those people. So Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad, the holy land of Palestine. In that holy land is the holy city of Jerusalem, Al-Quds. Third holy city in this world after Makkah and Medina. Which has the third holiest mosque in Islam. Al-Masjidul Aqsa. The Prophet ﷺ said, let no one travel to any masjid in the world. Except three masjids. The Masjidul Haram in Makkah. The Masjid al-Nabawi in my Masjid in Medina and the Masjid al-Aqsa. It is sufficient honor for that Masjid al-Aqsa 
that Allah took his Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the one who honors Medina is who? Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? Allah took him from the Kaaba, from Makkah, took him to that masjid to pray there. Imagine the status of that masjid, that Allah took him there. And not only him, when he arrived there on the night of the Isra and the Mi'raj, he found all the Anbiya of Allah, all the Prophets of Allah that came before him, all of them gathered in that masjid and pray. Subhanallah. Imagine all Allah's Prophets praying in that masjid. He arrived there with Jibreel Al on the Buraq. He tied the Buraq by a pillar there, which they still call it the, the Ha'it al-Buraq, the wall of the Buraq. And he went in the masjid and he prayed and he looked around and he sees a lot of people making salah in the masjid with people he has never seen before. Strange looking people in the, in the sense that their appearance, their clothing and all of that. People, who are these people? He's never seen them before. Jibreel alayhi salam said, Ya Rasulullah, these are your brothers, the Anbiya. There, right there is Nabi Musa. There, that's Nabi Isa. Jesus. That's Nabi Nuh, that's Nabi Adam, that's Nabi, all the Anbiya. Imagine. And when the, Nabi Sallallahu also prayed, and then an announcement was made of Salatu Jami'ah, that you are going to pray in Jama'ah, Salah in Jama'ah now, not everybody on their own. So they all stood up in rows. Nabi Sallallahu stood, and everybody is thinking, who is going to lead them? The first of mankind, the first Nabi Adam. The great Nabi Ibrahim, Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, Musa, they're all looking. The one who built the Masjid al-Aqsa, Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam, Solomon, King Solomon. And they're all looking and they're deciding. And Jibreel alayhi salam holds the hand of our Nabi sallallahu alayhi salam, puts him forward and said, Lead, O Muhammad, for you are the Imam of all the Anbiya. Lead. And he was being shy because he's the new one. You know, he's the new Nabi. These are all the experienced, the great ones. They live their lives. I'm still the new one that only started now. So he's being a bit nervous. Like a new teacher in a school. You know, you still knew all the other teachers for years already. But Jibreel held his hand and said, no, 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 Muhammad, you stand and you lead. You are their Imam. They all stand behind you. He made Imamat in that masjid. Imagine praying in a masjid where all of Allah's Nabis prayed together with Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The barakah of that masjid. That is the Masjid al-Aqsa. And it's a masjid that was built by Nabi Sulaiman as shukr to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted the kingdom of the Jews, the Israel at that time, you know, 3,000 years ago to Nabi Dawood alayhi salam. The people of Bani Israel, the Jews, came into war with the people that they were known as the, the, the Amalika, the Amalekites. And Nabi Dawood was a young boy and everybody from the Jews was scared to face those people and their leader came to fight the great warrior Goliath. Right? The story of the, David and Goliath. And what is Goliath called in the Quran? Anybody knows? How, what does Allah refer to him as in the Quran in Arabic? Jalut. Jalut. Not Talut. No. Jalut. Talut was a good person. Was the king of the Yahud. And he was a believer in Allah. Jalut. So Nabi Dawood, everybody is scared of fighting this man. And Nabi Dawood comes forward. They said he had a slingshot. And he said, I will face this enemy of Allah. And he was a, not an important person amongst them. A very poor person. And he hit him with that slingshot and killed him. And that immediately gave him a great status among the Yahud. Eventually Nabi Dawood salam, became the king of Palestine. King of the Yahud. At that time there were Yahud living there. And he was a great Nabi of Allah. They call him King David. After him, his son. And Nabi Dawood by the way, they said, even the birds and the mountains used to make tasbih with him, with him. When he used to sing his hymns, even the mountains would sing with him. You could hear them. After him, his son Nabi Sulaiman became the king. King Solomon. And Allah gave him such authority and kingdom that the Quran says that nobody had such a powerful kingdom and authority like Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam. It was not because of the stretch of land that he controlled. No, people had big, greater kingdoms than him when it came to land. Right? Alexander the, uh, the Great, Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad, uh, his kingdom was greater than the kingdom of Nabi Sulaiman. And 
other, but what made the kingdom of Nabi Sulaiman uh, the greatest kingdom was that Allah had given him authority over humans, over jinn, over animals, over birds, over what is in the oceans, over the wind, over the mountains. Now that is an authority no king on earth ever had. There can be many rulers and so on. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. But Allah had given that to Nabi Sulaiman. So it wasn't the, the, the piece of land that he, he, he controlled, that he ruled over. It wasn't that big. It was only Palestine, which is a small country. Right? Other kings ruled over mighty long empires. But what made it authority was that he controlled all the species that Allah created. And that no king has. No king can, can claim that. That was the power he had. So the jinns used to work for him. The birds used to work for him. The Quran says the bird used to be his spies. The, his birds were his spies. They used to come and report to him what's happening. He used to talk to animals and understand them. He used to understand even what the ant is saying. It's in the Quran, in the surah of the ants. Allah gave him such power. The, the, he used to control the wind. Imagine. Huh? 4,000 years before the invention of aeroplanes. There was a man who controlled the wind and flew wherever he wanted to go. On the wind, without any, uh, any plane or anything. And there is a famous story of a man, a minister of Nabi Sulaiman that was sitting next to him. And another man came in the court, strange looking man, and was staring at the minister. Kept on staring and staring and staring. So the minister got irritated and said to Nabi Sulaiman, who is this man and why does he stare at me? Keep on staring at me. You know, maybe he wants to kill me. Or, I'm worried. Nabi Sulaiman said, that's the Malakul Maut. <laughs> the angel of death. So the man said, yeah, Nabi Sulaiman, that's, uh, you know, he's here for me. You know, Please do me a favor. Nabi Sulaiman said, yes, anything. What, do you, what must I do for you? He was a close friend of Nabi Sulaiman. He said, send me to a far away country. Like he said, send me to India. He went to Palestine. He said, send me to India, which is very far away. So Nabi Sulaiman ordered the wind to take this man to India. Imagine from Palestine, within a few seconds, he was transported to India over the wind. Even in the fastest aeroplane can't do that today. That's how Nabi Sulaiman used to control. Allah said, we subjugated the winds to him. Which king can have that kingdom? So when that happened, after that the Malakul Maut came to greet Nabi Sulaiman. Greeted him. Nabi Sulaiman said to him, My brother, you scared my friend. Why did you do that? He said, The reason I was staring at him like that was because I had received orders from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I'm this morning, you know, that I'm supposed to take this man's ruh. Today, in India, but he's still sitting here in Jerusalem. So that is why I'm looking at him and I'm looking and thinking, but this man I'm supposed to, you know, uh, take his ruh in India, but he's sitting in Palestine, in Jerusalem. So uh, it's not making, how is he going to get to India so far away? So Nabi Sulaiman said, I send him to India, go fetch him. <laughs> So you know, mouth, that is mouth, when it comes to you, it comes to you. La tadri, wa la tadri, nafsun, bi ayyi ardin tamut. Allah says, and no soul knows where it shall die. No soul knows in which land, where you're going to die. Nobody knows. You can be born in one country, live in another country, die in a third country. Nobody knows. So Nabi Sulaiman had that power. Again, we can speak for hours about Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam and all his stories and all that. Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam, but the point that is relevant to us now. Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam and Allah gave him that great power. He said, Ya Allah, I want to express my gratitude to you and shukr to you for what you have given me. And I want to do it by building a place of worship for you. A magnificent masjid. 
for your ibadah and your worship, where you shall be praised night and day. A magnificent, nobody has ever built a masjid like that. I want to build it for you, Ya Allah. Now that is the right way of dealing with great wealth and great power. If Allah gives you great wealth and great power, then express your shukr to Allah like that. Not become a transgressor and an evil person. I want to build a masjid like none other, Ya Allah. So Allah said, Bismillah, I gave him the permission. And Jibreel alayhi salam guided him where and how to build the masjid. And he built the masjid ul-Aqsa. So the masjid ul-Aqsa was established by Nabi Sulaiman. And that's why the Nabi sallam refers to it in many hadiths as Masjid Sulaiman. The mosque of Sulaiman alayhi salam. And the Jews call it the Temple of Solomon. In the Jewish narration, it's called the Temple of Solomon. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala worshipped for hundreds of years. So that masjid, when it was finished... Nabi Sulaiman said, Ya Allah, I have made this for you. I only request one thing. That Ya Allah, you accept every dua and every salah that is made in this masjid. So Allah said to him, I grant you that. He said, I did this for you. Now I just want one request. Whoever comes to this masjid and prays here, oh Allah, accept their prayer and their dua. Nabi Sulaiman said, ask that. Allah said to him, yes, we accept. We grant you that. So imagine... The barakah of that place. So, so many Anbiya prayed there. And it is from there that our Nabi Sallallahu went on the Mi'raj. The stone on which he stood and from which he uh, went up. That stone is still there. And that rock is still there. It's not just a stone, it's a massive rock. And it is a rock under which Nabi Ibrahim used to pray. So that is in the part of the Masjid al-Aqsa, in the compound of the Masjid al-Aqsa, you found that. And there's a beautiful dome on that rock, which is known as the Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock, the golden one that you always see in the pictures, that golden dome. It's part of the Masjid al-Aqsa because it's part of the, comp- the compound of the Masjid al-Aqsa. People sometimes say, oh, the Masjid al-Aqsa is the front part and not the back part or the back part. Not the... There's no such thing. That entire compound, that walls, that enclosure... All of that is Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Al-Mubarak. Or as the Palestinian people call it, Al-Haram Al-Sharif. Al-Haram, because it's the third Haram. And it was so sacred that it was the Qibla of all the Anbiya that came before our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Their Qibla was the Aqsa. Nabi Musa, Nabi Isa, they all used to pray in the direction of the Aqsa. Even Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. For many years, he prayed to the direction of the Aqsa. Until Allah ordered him to turn towards the Kaaba. So subhanallah, Allahumma salli ala uh, Sayyidina Muhammad. Uh, <coughs> the Masjid al-Aqsa remained a masjid till the time uh, of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. In fact, till his mother's time, Sayyida Maryam, when she was born, her mother had willed. She was, uh, you know, a very pious woman. Now, what was the, the name of uh, Sayyida Maryam's father? Anybody know the name of Sayyida Maryam's, the Virgin Mary, the Holy Ma- Maryam? What was her father's name? Imran. Surah Ali Imran is about them, the family of Imran. Okay, now what was her mother's name? Hannah. Hannah. Right? Which you have to say Hannah. You know, in English they say Hannah. And even the English name Anne and Anna. You know, are from that. All the names that you have, Anna and Anne, and you know, they are all derived from that. The mother of Mary, you know, Hannah. So Hannah was a very pious woman. She wanted, uh, she made, she didn't have a child for a long time. So she made a niya, Ya Allah, if you give me a child and children, the first of those children, I will dedicate him to be a servant of the Masjid al-Aqsa and worship by the Masjid al-Aqsa. By the holy temple they used to call it, of Solomon. So she became pregnant. And she had a child. But then, فَلَمَّا وَضَعَتْهُ وَضَعَتْهُ unsa, She gave birth to a female child. وَلَيْسَ الزَّكَرُ kal unsa, And Allah then says, and the female is not like the male. Right? Female is not like the male. وَلَيْسَ الزَّكَرُ kal unsa, Male is different, female is different. So now there was a dilemma. What do we do? I, I, I'm going to dedicate the, the child to the Aqsa, but now this is a girl. And that was only for boys. So she said, no, I will still dedicate her. And her, her brother, Hannah's brother, was a great Nabi of Allah. 
Sayyidina Zakaria alayhi salam. Zakaria, as they say. Zakaria. He's, he was one of the great priests of the holy temple. He said, I will take that girl. They will not stop me. And they took her. And first, the, the rabbis of the Jews at that time, the, the, you know, they followed the Sharia of Musa alayhi salam that time, right? They said, no, you can't bring a girl here. A girl can't. He said, no, Allah has willed it. And Allah wants her to be. This, will be, this is a special girl. And eventually, Allah showed them signs. And she was then allowed to stay in the Masjid Al-Aqsa in a room there. She stayed in that room and nobody was allowed to go into that room but Zakaria, her uncle. So subhanAllah, she grew up to be a pious lady in the Masjid Al-Aqsa, Maryam I don't know if anybody's name is Maryam here. You know, that's what it all happened there. And Allah used to provide her with risk in that room of hers, fruits out of season as a miracle. So when Zakaria salam came there, he finds fruits and he said, Oh Maryam, who brought you this? It's not, it's out of season also. She would say, Huwa min andillah. It is from Allah, he provides as he wishes. So, Hunalika da'a Zakaria Rabbah. Now, Zakaria alayhi salam, like his sister, he also had a problem. His wife also was not giving birth. So, he made dua there by the room of Maryam alayhi salam. He stood up, he said, Ya Allah, if, you know, because he saw Allah's ni'mah there. He said, Ya Allah, Give me a child also. So Allah, Bashtarnahu bi Yahya, we granted him the good news of a son called Yahya, alayhi salam. So that mihrab, where he made dua, it is still there in the Masjid al-Aqsa. So if you go with somebody who knows, they'll show you the place where they say, Zakaria, Maryam used to stay, alayhi salam, and Zakaria, alayhi salam, made dua there. And Allah accepted this dua. So, make a dua there. It's already in the Aqsa, and then it's that place where they made dua. Make dua there if you don't have a child. Make, pray for a child. If you have a child, pray for their protection and goodness and guidance. Pray for the children of the Ummah. Pray for yourself. Whatever dua you want to make. These are all the holy sites they're going to show you when you go there to the Masjid Al-Aqsa. And then, after that, of course, Maryam miraculously gives birth to Isa alayhi salam. Jesus. And he then grows up in the holy temple and prays there and worships there for years. Nabi Isa used to pray there until when he called the Yahud to the straight path and they fought him and they threw him out of the temple. They said, we don't want you because he didn't want to hear the haqq. He told them that Allah will destroy this place of yours. Allah will destroy it because you have now corrupted it. So then after Nabi Isa left this world and Allah raised him up, Allah sent the Romans to attack Jerusalem. And they destroyed the Masjid Al-Aqsa completely. They, ki they kicked out all the Jews after killing hundreds of thousands of them. They kicked all of them out of Palestine. They demolished and burned the entire Masjid Al-Aqsa. What they used to call the Temple of Solomon. Well, Nabi Sulaiman's structure was completely vanquished. And it was left desolate after that. Only one wall was left from it. It was too difficult to break that wall. They would call it the Western Wall. And that's the wall where the Yahud go and cry. They call it the Wailing Wall. For 500 years, that masjid was left like that. <coughs> Nothing happening there, just an empty, desolate land. It is only when Sayyidina Umar radiallahu an conquered Jerusalem with the Sahaba of the Prophet sallallahu Allah gave Jerusalem to the Muslims. Sayyidina Umar then cleaned up that place and established the masjid there, the Masjid al-Aqsa. He re-established it at the masjid of Allah where Allah is worshipped. And he asked Sayyidina Bilal to give the first azan there. So Sayyidina Bilal was with them that day in Jerusalem. He gave the azan there. And the Masjid al-Aqsa was once again a place of worship and remains still today a place of worship. Now the Masjid al-Aqsa, uh, many Sahaba were part of rebuilding it. So some of their graves are also in the graveyard behind the Masjid al-Aqsa. Sayyidina Shaddad bin Aus radiallahu an, Sayyidina Ubada bin As-Samit radiallahu an, uh, Sayyidina Darar radiallahu an, and others. Their graves are behind the Masjid al-Aqsa. Sahaba of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that are buried there. And there are other Sahaba buried in uh, Palestine as well. But another great place to visit in Palestine, outside of Jerusalem and the Masjid al-Aqsa, is the holy city of Al-Khalil, or what the Jews call Hebron. Because that is where Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam is buried. So Nabi Ibrahim and his wife Sarah and then his son Ishaq and his wife 
and his son Yaqub and his wife and their son Yusuf four prophets of Allah one by one by one are buried in that complex in Al Khalil the whole city is called Al Khalil because Nabi Ibrahim cited Al Khalilullah that is one of the places that on the night of the Mi'raj our Prophet was ordered to make Salah there he prayed in that masjid where Nabi Ibrahim is buried next to the Maqam of Nabi Ibrahim and that mosque or that structure was built by Nabi Sulaiman because Nabi Ibrahim is the ancestor of Nabi Sulaiman he built it and he, the rocks uh, the bricks of that structure are so massive that you can't believe any human being built that and that's why the ulama said that it was built by the jinn Nabi Ibrahim and Nabi Sulaiman ordered the jinn to assist in the building of that masjid that's why you have these massive bricks that you believe how can a human being even lift something like this even 50 human beings can't lift a stone like this so you visit Nabi Ibrahim the man that you mention in your salah five times a day Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Ali Sayyidina Muhammad Kama sallayta ala Sayyidina Ibrahim wa ala Ali There are two Nabis you mention in every salat Every namaz Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Sayyidina Ibrahim He is the second ranking in the Anbiya by the way After our Prophet the greatest ranking Prophet The greatest human that ever lived Is Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam You will be honored to visit his maqam His grave, his mazar and greet him and, and salam on him and, and you're remembering that our Nabi also was there Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then you also have on the other side of Jerusalem the town of Jericho in Arabic they call it Ariha where you have the maqam of Nabi Musa Alaihi Salam Nabi Musa wanted to be buried in Jerusalem but he couldn't so he made a wish that, oh Allah, at least if, I don't, if I'm not buried in Jerusalem, then bury me a stone's throw away from the holy city. Not too far away. So he was buried in Jericho, and Jericho is just half an hour from, even less than that, 20 minutes from Jerusalem. It's the maqam of Nabi Musa alayhi salam. And our Nabi sallam passed by that maqam on the night of the Mi'raj. He said, wallahi, I passed by the grave of Musa, and I saw him making salah inside his cover. By the Red Hill, the Nabi Sallallahu said. And that's where he is, by the Red Hill. Also in Palestine, you have Beit Lahim. Also, 45 minutes from Jerusalem, is a church built on the place where Nabi Isa salam was born. Our Nabi Sallallahu prayed that on the night of the Mi'raj. A great miracle happened there. So you can go to Beit Lahim and visit the church of the Nativity and see the spot where Jesus was born. We say the Maryam gave birth to him, the Immaculate Birth, with no man ever touching her. Allah created him directly inside her womb. And he was born there. Of course, it's a Christian site, so we respect uh, that, and we, you know, uh, keep, you know, uh, we don't make too much noise and all that and so on. But Muslims are allowed to go there, and regularly the Muslims go in there and they visit the place of Nabi Isa alayhi salam inside that church. So Jamaat al Muslimin. These are some of the holy sites and the great sites and the historical sites in the land of Palestine and Jordan. And there are many others as well. So, and the stories of each one, I've given you just a, what we call you know, a tip of the iceberg. Each one has a great story. And I would recommend everyone to read up these stories in detail. When you're going there, read up the story of Nabi Musa, read up the story of Ashab al read up the story of Nabi Ibrahim. So that when you go there, you have the full story, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take you all safely there and accept all your ziyaras and remember all of us in your duas and may everyone come back home safely as well. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakumullah khairan jazatu Sheikh Fakhuddin Uwaisi for his uh, beautiful discourse. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him. Amen. And inshallah, when we get to the old city, then we discover and um, we asked um, uh, the old city is divided into the Christian quarter the Jewish quarter and the Muslim quarter and you'll be able to see the startling differences and also the startling similarities in how fervent the worshippers are in practicing the Abrahamic faith so you'll come out from certain quarters and you'll see the Jews going to Jewish school the Christians going to Christian school and uh, you'll find, uh, and the Muslims going to Al-Aqsa. Uh, the Christians, you will see that they have certain stations of the cross, so they reenact every day 
according to their narrative, how uh, uh, Jesus, according to their narrative, went to the various crosses before he was finally crucified, according to their narrative. And the holiest church for them is called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And the amazing part of that church is that the keys of the church is kept by a Muslim. So you will see that uh, what's amazing is to see all the different um, religions and how they practice their faith. And uh, you will, when you speak to the people in the old city, they will tell you that these three faith systems, they coexisted for thousands of years. Right? For thousand years they coexisted in peace and harmony. <coughs> in fact, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, he told one of the Sahaba when he was granted the keys to the city to bring in 70 Jewish families because they were massacred and um, taken out of the city. But he said the city is holy to the Jews as well. And he brought 70 of those families back. So it tells you how, with what justice, the Khulafa Rashidun, when they came into the city, how they dealt um, you know, with those who were against them. So inshallah, you'll find it amazing. The old city in Jerusalem is an amazing place. You will feel that you are going back in time. And the walk to the Al-Aqsa Masjid, uh, the Qibli Masjid, is a beautiful walk because you go through the, the, the alleyways. And many a times you'll find when we recite the Salawat, and we bring in the, the dhikr and the salawat in the alleyways, you'll find the people in the apartments up that will give the response and the jawab in a sense. So, um, alhamdulillah, we'll have the honor of uh, praying in Masjid al-Aqsa. We'll have the honor in playing in Qubbat al-Sakhra. And uh, we will have the honor, inshallah, to do some athkar. We were fortunate that in Masjid al-Aqsa itself, in the Masjid Qibli, that on Friday mornings they do the Mawlid. And uh, we'll have the opportunity, inshallah, to do some of our athkar and some of our barzanji, inshallah, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, because it's going to be the time and the mosim of the Mawlid. Remember in Aqsa as well, in Jerusalem as well, we have the maqam of Sayyidina Salman al-Farsi, and you have the maqam of Sayyidina Rabi al-Basri. So we will be visiting those places, right? Uh, maqam doesn't necessarily mean that they are buried there. It means that they may have spent some time there. So it will be important for us to visit some of those places. What is also very interesting is the, the, um, the um, uh, maqam of Sayyidina Dawood. And you'll find that that is very much controlled by the Jews. And many a times when we go to visit there, you will find that um, many of them are amazed that we have come. And we speak about Nabi Dawood, and we spend some time there. You'll also find in Khalil Basayna Ibrahim, uh, whenever people in Jerusalem want to get married, they uh, have the engagement day at Sayyidina Ibrahim al Khalil. So they come there and they pay their respects and they get engaged in the al Khalil compound. Now, what's also very important, which I find, uh, you know, whenever we take do these trips, we remember the ladies of Diyarbakar in the Turkish area. Um, these ladies from Diyarbakar, they were very well known for the rose gardens and the rose bushes. So they had amongst the most beautiful rose bushes. And what they, they did, once when Salahuddin al Ayyubi came into their town, these ladies of Diyarbakar, they called for a meeting with him. And they said to the uh, the general, he was the Muslim general at the time, that um, uh, we have something that we would like to discuss with you. So they called a meeting. He went to visit them. And in the meeting they said, we have something that we need, an amana that we would like you to deliver on our behalf. So he said, yes, absolutely, I will do so. So they said to him that we are the ladies of Diyar Bakr. We are well known for our beautiful rose gardens. And we have now made out of those beautiful roses, we have made rose oil. And we want this rose oil to be delivered to Al-Aqsa so that the compound of Al-Aqsa can be cleansed, like Sayyidina Umar did, mm -hmm. with the uh, rose oil from our rose bushes. Now then he realized, because that time 
uh, Jerusalem was occupied. So basically the amana they gave him that he has to deliver it, but in order to deliver it, he has to conquer the city. And it took him five years from that point with fervor until finally he managed to conquer the city and deliver the rose oil of the ladies of the Arbakar. That's why you'll find many a times when we travel on this trip, we have some of the ladies that bring the rose oil with them to remember that important amana that was given and they take the rose oil and they even wash the walls. So feel free to do that. Bring your rose oil with you, inshallah. And let us make this a trip that we will never ever forget. This is amongst the most sacred places. Um, and when you stand at the Dome of the Rock, and when you are there at Qubba al Sakhra, and you are at that position where the Rasul ascended to the heavens, they say you have to travel the whole world but to go to the heavens, you have to come to Aqsa. Because it's called the gateway to the heavens. And you get an opportunity to pray under the rock. That the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ascended into the heavens. So inshallah, we ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to grant us good health Amen. after the Umrah and hopefully being cleansed in the washing machine of Mecca. Amen. We will then proceed to the holy lands of Al-Aqsa inshallah to pay our respects to not only the place but to the holiest of people that are buried there and to remember the night of the mi'raj and the isra of our beloved master sayyidina muhammad oh, oh, we'll also go to hayatul buraq so you'll find we'll go to the masjid where the buraq was tied right and you'll see that in the one side of the masjid are the muslims praying of the wall the muslims are praying and on the other side of the wall is the wailing wall and on one occasion, we also had the opportunity to go visit the wailing wall. Now, on that occasion, I remember I was dressed with my, uh, with my thobe and I was wearing my an imama. And, uh, and as I was walking towards Al-Aqsa, one of the uh, a Jewish men came down, a youngster, about my age, I'm also young. <laughs> and uh, he came down and the two of us got to talk. And he said, I'm from New York. And uh, about three years ago, I decided to immigrate to Jerusalem because I wanted to spend the rest of my life in the Holy Lands. I was a very successful banker in New York, but I decided to migrate and come to spend the rest of my days so that my children can have a better uh, religious life, right, in Jerusalem. So whilst we got to talk, he said to me, have you ever been to the wedding wall? I said, no. He said, come, let's go. So he took me, so you can imagine, whilst they were busy with the wailing wall reading, and I pitched up there with my imama and my kurta. So I was definitely standing out like a sore thumb. Yeah. But it's an experience. It's an experience, and I was with him, and he was explaining to me how they do things. So the human element is there, right? And, uh, and I remember on one occasion when we were in our ihram, leaving for Makkah out of Masjid Al-Aqsa, uh, some of the guards, at that time, they stopped us and they asked us, uh, because we were doing the labbaik, so they asked us, what are you doing? So some of the people got a bit agitated, so I said, no, relax, let's talk to them. So I said to him, can you tell me the difference amongst these people, who is the rich man and who is the poor man? They said, no. So I said, you see, we are on our way to Mecca and we know that we have a temporary life. So we are preparing for the time that we have to be buried underground in our graves. And we will only be wearing these two pieces of cloth. And we want the transition not to be difficult, so we are doing a practice run. <laughs> and we cannot carry our credit cards, we can't carry anything. This is meant for simplicity and it makes us humble so nobody can see the difference between the two of us. It was one of those unique incidences where that guard who asked me that question, I actually saw him wipe his eyes. He teared and he told the fellow guard, I told you they have good in them. So there's always exceptions. You know, many of them are volumine, but there are some of them that if you speak to them, you may be able to touch the human element. 
So we must always be in our best of conduct. None of the Jews, not many of the Jews and the Christians, they have not read the Quran. You will find that they have not read the Hadith. They don't have exposure to what we have. The only thing they are exposed to is Muslims and their conduct. Our conduct is the biggest form of da'wah. They haven't been exposed to the Quran and the Hadith, but they are exposed to Muslim behavior. On one occasion, I just want to share this to Sheikh Fakhruddin. We were standing on Jabal Mukabbir and we were looking at the hole. That's where Sayyidina Umar first saw Al-Aqsa and he said Takbir. And we'll have a chance to do the Takbirat day in tradition. And whilst we were there, one of the, the, the Jewish guides, he was listening to our explanation to the group. And he was there with a South African Jew from Johannesburg. And he was showing her everything from the Jewish perspective. But midway through, the two of them came to listen to what we had to say. And they stood there for some time. And in fact, after he finished, he said, I was very happy to hear what I heard. I'm actually from, uh, I'm a Jew, but my forefathers come from Syria. And we had a beautiful life, I used to hear of the beautiful life we had living amongst the Muslims. And at that moment, when we were having this discussion and he was, wanted to share some ideas, one of our Palestinian brothers who was with us, he lost his cool and he became very upset that we were having a dialogue. And um, at that moment, we realized that there is a lot of hurt. There's a lot of challenges and a long road to recovery by virtue of a lot of dhulm that has taken place. And you'll find that many of our Palestinian brothers and sisters are justifiably scarred. But we have to put our best foot forward because the best way we can deal with the kind of uh, perception that they have put out of the Muslim that we are bloodthirsty, uh, blood-sucking uh, barbarians who have very terrible behavior is to show them the best of akhlaq. Because the akhlaq and the good akhlaq will do away with all the propaganda and the lies that they spread. And I realized that on that occasion that those people that we interacted amongst the Jews they were very happy to see that we are willing to have dialogue with them. We present our narrative, right? And we speak to them in the best forms and manners. When we were in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, I remember when we spoke about Isa alayhi salam, and uh, there was a whole group of Christians that came into the room. And what do we speak about? Because it's the place where they say that Jesus was crucified and he ascended to the heavens from that church. And, um, and so we spoke about what happened with Sayyidina Umar and how he treated the people when he entered the city. So the nun that was sitting there, she asked the question, what is the difference between our belief of Jesus and his crucifixion and what you believe? Now, you know, it's a very challenging topic. We could speak about, you know, all. So the response we gave to them was, the difference between our narrative and your narrative is that we believe that Jesus ascended before the event and you believe he ascended after the event. That meaning we believe he ascended before crucifixion took place and you believe he ascended after crucifixion took place. So inshallah we hope Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us the hikmah and the tawfiq to always put our best foot forward. We are the ambassadors of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and we need to introduce uh, them to our Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam with the best of adab and akhlaq. Jazakum Allah khair and jaza inshaAllah. The time is approaching, right? And so I just need to share with everyone: you need to start getting fit. You need to start walking, <laughs> right? If I go to Sea Point and I don't see you there, or if you go here into uh, the avenues where they have some of these parks and you are not walking. Uh, I'm going to be making those calls because there's walking that needs to take place, right? And we need, you don't have to go to the gym or Virgin Active, just walk. Because we need to get into that system of walking, inshallah. Bi'ilillahi ta'ala. Shukran jazeelan, jazakumullah khairan. Any questions?
Anything that you would like to ask Sheikh Fakhruddin? Right? Inshallah, remember that we will be departing on the 23rd, right? Bi idnillah. And uh, tomorrow morning, inshallah, your itinerary for the three haram will be out. Inshallah. Then we will know on the three Saturdays where we will be. Right? So that we can plan our athkars and our programs, inshallah. Uh, we've also been contacted by Dr. Ahmed Hafiz. They've planned a beautiful maulid on the Thursday night in Medina. The only challenge, uh, Hajar Naima, it's maulid only for men. <laughs> because it's the maulid time. Then they invite all the mashayikh of Medina to Munawwara. But we will have our maulid, inshallah, that will be for our entire group, for both the males and the females. Inshallah, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Shukran jazeelan, jazakumullahu khairan jaza. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept, inshallah. Next week, we will be moving now to Iraq. Mm. Right? Wow. So remember, for those who are traveling on the three haram, I would suggest you come for those classes because it has a lot of dimensions that will also, uh, you know, make you understand the three haram components also beautifully. So next week, inshallah, we will be doing Najaf and Karbala. And the following week, we'll be doing Baghdad. Allah. In the Baghdad class, in the end of that, inshallah, we will do a final element in relation to our three haram as well before we depart. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept, inshallah, grant khair and barakah. Ameen, ameen. And we will conclude with Surah Al-Asr by Sheikh Mujahid Tawfi. Bismillah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wal-Asr. Inna Allah. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.